listen to some advice from experienced hikers about making the most of your hiking experience. I mean, if you want a real primitive trail, um, the Bartram Trail, the, the Benton Mackay Trail, the Pinhoti Trail, those are trails that uh, you can walk on for days and never run into another person. But uh, um, I think as far as saying the AT, we can get the AT to be like that at some point in time, I think you, um, that ship has sailed already. <laughs> I mean, the AT is what it is. People are always going to walk on it. I think even in the wilderness areas, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with ha enjoying the wilderness around you and being on a well-structured trail that you're actually walking on. Well, there, there are two different categories. There are the people who have heard of the Appalachian Trail but really don't know whether they want to get into backpacking or not. And the Pinhoti, particularly in Alabama, and to a certain extent in Georgia on a certain segment, is a good training ground. You know, you learn whether or not you can walk 15 miles a day and be comfortable. You can learn whether or not you can sleep out on the ground, whether you can find water, whether you can cook your meal without burning the forest down, uh, without getting out on the Appalachian Trail. The other is the people who have done the AT and said, well, I've done it, uh, don't want to do anything else. The importance of the AT in terms of providing us with a green space corridor that's all up and down the East Coast that helps to, um, uh, to promote wildlife and um, flora and fauna. But we have so close to us this real gem where you can get away from concrete, be out in nature, and it's a great way to just appreciate what we have out there. And there are easy, short hikes that people can do to just sort of check it out and see if they like it and see how they feel. And anybody that I know that I've brought up to the AT who hasn't been a hiker has really just kind of fallen in love with. Um, the views that you get from up here, being out in the green space, I mean, I do have one friend that says, hike, why do you hike? You mean you're just walking with no purpose in mind? But, but to me, walking with no purpose in mind is the purpose. There's always something crazy. Uh, one of the craziest and one of the funniest, uh, we were uh, swapping out a privy, which like I said, you have to take the walls down, you have to pull the flooring up, and you have to empty out the side that's been composting for two years. And we take that material because it's, it's bacteria free, we've had it tested, there's less bacteria in our compost piles than there is in Lake Lanier. So it's, it's safe to touch, but we still wore PPE. We take that material, we spread it on the forest floor. So you, but you have to empty it out, which is a time consuming job. And we were, we were some people are, are shoveling, some people are holding buckets, some people are out in the forest spreading it out. At that particular time, I was one of the spreaders, so I was not that close to the privy at the time. And all of a sudden, there was screaming bloody murder. I thought, oh my gosh, somebody's hurt. That's the worst possible thing on a work trip for somebody to be hurt. So I went running over there, and what had happened was, as they were cleaning out the compost pile, a huge rat came hop running out of the pile. And of course, you know, the people that weren't, you know, uh, trying to hit him with a shovel, were running for their lives. Trying, some people were climbing up on the privy to get away from him. You know, some people were laughing, some people were screaming. <laughs> and uh, Roy Stallings, eventually, uh, the rat, there was something wrong with him because he didn't, he didn't run off like you'd expect him to. And he wasn't really trying to attract us, but he, once he hopped out, he was running around in circles. So we thought something's wrong with this rat anyway. So Roy Stallings grabbed a shovel and uh, relieved us, got that rat out of our misery. We later had a uh, man who uh, threatened to kill the uh, employees of the Forest Service, uh, all kinds of things, because he didn't want his land taken for the Appalachian Trail. Well, we ended up, it wasn't his land. He didn't own it. Uh, he was just opposed to the federal government, and he was saying it was his, but it wasn't. But that didn't matter. Uh, so it was, it, was, it was nasty, and we ended up, the U assistant U.S. attorney got U.S. marshals. He wouldn't let us go on that land, even though he didn't own it. Uh, 
the assistant U.S. attorney out of Knoxville, I think, got U.S. marshals to go out there and guard our surveyors uh, and uh, appraisers to appraise that tract. And uh, they had to go out there. And in the end, when we won the suit, uh, he had to reimburse us the cost of the uh, uh, law enforcement people and appraisers. But in the South, there were some rough people you dealt with, and there were some mighty good people, too. Unfortunately, we've had several aircraft mishaps in and around the Appalachian Trail. And, uh, and, the, and some of those have occurred in wilderness. Single plane air, I can think of one single plane aircraft uh, several years back that went down. Fortunately, somehow, the two individuals in the plane came out, walked, walked out. Um, but what was left was a single engine uh, plane literally uh, stuck above ground in some trees. Um, over in the, um, I want to say that was in Mark Trail Wilderness. I could have that a little off, but it was in a wilderness area. And, um, of course, we were excited that the two individuals were safe, but, uh, hey, what are we going to do with this plane literally in our trees here? Um, and it was within several hundred feet of the AT corridor, AT trail itself, trail tread. And of course, so we had to, but then we had that wilderness on top, created complexity on top of that because you can't just go in, again, the wilderness is about minimizing human impact. So how do you, or first question was, should we remove this plane? Of course, the insurance company was ready to pull it right out of there. And uh, through some analysis, we were able to determine, okay, yes, it makes sense to remove this plane. It's clearly not natural. Um, let's do it. And it makes sense. It's the safest, most least impact to the wilderness resource to do it to remove it quickly, um, and to do it in a way that has the least impact on the on the hiking community. And so, what ended up happening was we did after some analysis, we allowed the the insurance company to bring a helicopter in, literally pull it out of there, back down to the valley, and get rid of that thing. I used to kind of hike fairly fast, and people say you don't see anything. And I'd get up there and I'd walk a while and I'd say, did you see those flowers back there? And they said, no. I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> You're not looking either. <laughs> I mean, I can see stuff. I got a lot of sore knees where I've tripped. <laughs> so I had an odd experience a couple of years ago. I went up to work on my section, which is uh, near Woody Gap. And I was hiking, uh, uh, I wanted to hike through the section and then turn around and work my way back. And as I was going south, uh, I passed a, a young couple who were carrying big things. The, the, the guy had this long case with a handle on it. They had full backpacks on. The woman was carrying a big square something that also had a handle on it. So I said, hey to them and they didn't really speak um, and I figured well carrying all that heavy stuff they're probably not in a good mood but I got to the end of the section and turned around and when I was working my way back I got to Ramrock Mountain which is one of the places on the trail where you, you can see the Atlanta skyline and Stone Mountain 70 miles away it's a really nice um, overlook and as I was approaching it I heard what I thought was cello music so as I got closer and closer, it was cello music. And <clears throat> when I got up there, this guy was carrying an, an electric cello, so it didn't have the big body. And he was he and and what she was carrying was a big speaker. And I don't know what they were powered by, but uh, he had set up the speaker and he was playing cello music out over the uh, the overlook. And uh, I was watching one of the. Uh, uh, movies that uh, through hikers make uh, later on and this guy's actually in it and he made it to uh, I think he made it to Damascus with that cello he made it somewhere up north with it and then he he abandoned the idea of through hiking with a cello and a speaker <clears throat> and the beavers built a dam downstream and the water built up it was up over the bridge so the forest service said go out there and see if there's anything we can do so uh, another guy and I went out that day and we found the beaver dam and sure enough, the bridge, it was up over the bridge. You know, so we said, well, we need to tear this down. Well, let me tell you, 
Beavers build strong structures. You would think it's just a pile of brush that you can just pull off. It's not. They're, how, they, how they do it, I don't know, but they interweave all the branches. It's one big chunk of brush. So we, we got our boots on, we went out there, we started pulling it down. Well, we only got it about half tore down, but we thought, but the water was flowing better. You could see the water had come down below the bridge. So we thought, good job, good job. So we went home. A week later, we went back, we just wanted to check on it. Walked out there, the, water, the dam was built back. The water was back up over the bridge. So we thought, I don't know what's going on. Well, the beavers are harder worker than we are. So we did the same thing. We tore it down, but we, and we, this time we tore it down almost to the bottom, but not quite, because we just ran out of time. So we left, went home, we said, you know what, we better go back and check this thing in another week. We went back in a week, he had built the entire structure back. And we had done a little research on beavers this time. And one thing about beavers, if they hear water running, if they hear water splashing, it's sort of an incentive for them to build a dam. So as long as there was part of the dam there to create this rushing waterfall, they would be inclined to, to rebuild it. So that time we brought extra workers, we brought hooks to pull the thing down, and we tore it down into the stream. We dug out the stream. We have completely obliterated that beaver dam. And when we went back the next week, it wasn't rebuilt. I guess my, my favorite memory of that was the Springer one, when the Army in a helicopter uh, brought in the uh, timber for the timber frame shelter, brought in his helicopter. I uh, can't remember what the brand was. But anyway, they landed <clears throat> on top of Springer. There's a clearing that they uh, landed. And we unloaded everything. <clears throat> and when it got time to leave, the helicopter wouldn't crank. <laughs> so they left one of the crewmen up there uh, while we took some folks back down to the ranger camp. And they had to, somebody had to stay with that helicopter overnight. And they came in the next day, I guess, and got it running. And, Got it off the mountain. <laughs> that was a that was that was something. Uh, the other one that was a, a, a good one was a plum orchard. That one was dropped by one of those uh, two rotor helicopters. Unfortunately, it, it missed the foundation uh, by a good bit. And so Mary McLean got a group together one Saturday and said, "We're going up and put it on the foundation." And we went uh, along with a couple of Forest Service technicians, and a small bulldozer and went up there and wrestled that shelter onto the concrete foundation. Uh, that, that was probably one of the biggest accomplishments. We, we looked at it and we said, I don't think this can be done, <laughs> but uh, we managed to, to get that thing on the, on the foundation. Nancy Schaffner may not forgive me for telling this story, but one of the first long distance stories, I, well, long distance hikes I did with GATC was just an, an ad hoc hike with a group of people who again invited me to come along when I first started backpacking. And we did a, a traverse of the Smokies from north to south. And so this was like in May. And it, it was my first long distance hike. And I was so excited. And we had some bad weather the first couple of nights. So we were staying in a shelter, Madryn Bald maybe. Um, and it had been raining like crazy. So we were in the top bunks and Nancy was next to me and it w there was a leak by her, uh, but, you know, through the, through the uh, roof. And so she put a plastic bag out to catch the drips and it caught drips and so forth for a while. And there was a guy down below us that we didn't know. And all of a sudden her plastic bag tipped over and it just dumped a whole bag full of water on this guy who just jumped up and yelped. And she just got down in her sleeping bag really quiet and just uh, pretended like she didn't know what was going on. <laughs> As the song goes, what a wonderful work. We hope that you will hike at least part of one of the four major trails in North Georgia and experience the wonderful world that awaits you there. It will be an experience you will never forget. Oh, day three.
Just an old sweet song Is Georgia on my mind Georgia Georgia This song for you It's as sweet and clear As moonlight to the pines Yeah, yeah, yeah Other arms reach out to me Other eyes smile tenderly But still in peaceful dreams I see Back to you Georgia Georgia No peace do I find Like an old sweet sound It's your job.